Hello, I'm Marie Humphrey, the CEO of 360 Thought Leadership and Webinar Program Manager for FP&A Trends. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us for our global FP&A Trends webinar today, driver-based analysis, empowering the right decision. We are thrilled to have FP&A and finance professionals from over 30 countries registered for our webinar today. Any business decision-making process requires both analytics and judgment. Intuition is important, but given the increasing complexity of business dynamics, intuition needs data-driven validation. In an environment of black swans and perfect storms, the decision-making process needs to become more analytical. One of the biggest fp &A challenges is how to identify key business drivers from the ocean of data. By understanding key metrics that drive value, organizations can significantly improve their understanding of different business outcomes and react effectively to expected and unexpected changes in business conditions. Before I welcome our featured speakers to the webinar, I'm going to offer a few words about FP&A Trends, the International FP&A Board, Global FP&A Trends webinars, and then cover a few housekeeping items in our agenda for the valuable time you have chosen to invest in spending with us today. Our webinar today is driven by FP&A Trends Group, a fantastic resource for thought leadership in person and online. They are the owners of the International FP&A Board, which is now active in 15 cities, 11 countries, and four continents, recently expanded to the United States, have great online FP&A education, including our global FP&A webinars today, also offer FP&A strategic consulting and research. I highly encourage you to visit the FP&A Trends webinar and the LinkedIn group as well. The mission of the International FP&A Board is to guide the development and promotion of better practices in global FP&A and identify and support new trends, skill sets, and innovation. Very key for our webinar today, which we have developed to share FP&A better practices and thought leadership across the world, which is evident in the fact that we have professionals from over 30 countries on the phone with us today. Also, we only offer one global FP&A webinar a month as to offer our audience the best speakers and the most impactful content. A few housekeeping items. The slides are currently available under the handouts area in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll send you links via email with a presentation and recording over the next 24 to 48 hours. We'd like to hear from you, so please ask your questions in the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel for the Q&A session we will hold during the tail end of the webinar. Fear not. If we do not get to your question, we'll follow up with you directly after the webinar. Finally, we appreciate your consideration in taking a short survey at the end of the webinar today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. A quick note on the agenda before I welcome our, introduce our featured speakers. We're going to kick things off. Uh, Larissa Milnichuk is going to give us a fantastic overview of driver-based analysis, key definitions and concepts, and then we're going to welcome to the webinar uh, Tanya Sleesinger, and she's going to offer us a fantastic case study, how she's been able to drive finance transformation at her company. Then we're going to offer you some conclusions and recommendations. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome our featured speakers to the webinar today, uh, Tanya Sleesinger and Larissa Milnichuk. Tanya currently serves in the role of VP of Finance at DB Region AG, Region Central. She has over 20 years of experience in multiple senior management, finance, and strategic functions. Her experience includes 15 years at Deutsche Bank as the CFO of logistics company, financial auditing, and the VP of public mass transit. And she previously served as a finance director at Lauda Air. She is strongly convinced that the future of FP&A lies in total transparency for better decision and competitiveness, and is quite eager to take advantage of digitalization of processes. Larissa is the founder and managing director of FP&A Trends. As I mentioned, FP&A Trends helps companies realize their innovative FP&A potential through training, consulting, professionals, networking, and debating. She is an experienced FP&A practitioner, having held senior positions at Invisys Ace Group, KeyBank, and HSBC before setting up and running the international FP&A board. She has been the driving the board expansion into 11 countries into Europe, the Middle East, the USA, and Australia. With that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Larissa. Larissa, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, to greet you at this second uh, international, uh, glo our global 
FPNA webinar. So the last one was exactly one month ago, and we were talking about uh, strategic planning and integrated planning. And uh, this uh, today's subject is uh, so logical uh, to continue our conversation. So we are going to talk about driver-based planning uh, analysis approach, and uh, we are going to talk uh, to look at one of the successful case studies of transformation. But before we do this, I really would like to remind you uh, about our incredible business environment. And this is a great demonstration why driver-based planning approach uh, is so important at the moment. So obviously, the environment of FTNA it could be very well described with this uh, very famous quote from Don Donald Rumsfeld, former U.S. Defense Secretary, when he said that there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. The reality is that we, with our current uh, traditional methods, we're really good at known knowns. This is our business as usual, or with known unknowns. This is our new initiative. But more often, uh, we really uh, meet in our work this unknown unknown situations. Uh, the black swans and perfect storms when situations change incredibly and very, very quickly. And this is the reason why driver-based analytics approach is very important. So the next slide, please. So what is driver-based approach? Uh, the reality is that this is the approach that bases financial planning and analysis on operational drivers or activities, both external and internal. This is a really fantastic tool for us to develop this forward-looking approach and also to react very quickly um, to, to, to any change in the business. And obviously, this is the way to go for FTNA for the unknown un unknown environment. Next slide. So uh, the, the, uh, obviously, uh, it's not a new approach for us at all in finance. Uh, we always operated in uh, partially driver-based models, and the examples are obviously uh, the way how we forecast. Uh, our the revenue or sales for business. This is how we manage uh, our variable expenses and so on so far. But the reality is fully driver-based models, they still are quite rare in uh, financial planning and analysis industry. But this is the way for us to go because we really need to be very quick. So if we go to the next slide, please. And this is the reason uh, why driver-based planning approach uh, really matters for financial planning and analysis. Everything about speed at the moment, so it allows us to be very quick. Everything about simplicity of reforecasting and replanning. Uh, also, it's fantastic for scenario planning and obviously for decision making. Uh, this is fantastic and this is the basis for forward-looking approach for so-called predictive analytics. Uh, and this is the way for us to do these insightful uh, decisions uh, very quickly. Uh, it's less judgmental and more analytical approach. Uh, and uh, as we know, traditional budgeting culture is very judgmental. And it allows us uh, to, to improve quality of our forecasting process, as well as uh, to improve uh, the, the level of collaboration between companies. So if we go to the next slide now. Uh, we always say that in modern FTNA, uh, driver-based analytics, driver-based planning is the basis for scenario planning, predictive analytics, good quality role in forecast. This is the way how we can integrate uh, our different planning activities uh, in the company. We can do this through different cascade of drivers and also through implementation this to one uh, unified system as well. And obviously, this is the way how we can improve corporate vision and how we can improve decision-making process. So if we go to the next slide, uh, it's just demonstrate one of the biggest challenges of driver-based planning. You know, it's about finding this 20% of drivers from the hundreds, sometimes thousands of drivers, and uh, to find those the most sensitive, the most uh, important drivers those that can uh, explain 80% of our results. So every project that I see uh, at the moment uh, in different parts of the globe, they're around this. I know the companies that already started to use 
machine learning and artificial intelligence for the purpose of finding those key drivers. Uh, very often, um, pe people concentrate on external and internal drivers, uh, but also some quantitative and qualitative drivers as well. And I know uh, one of the biggest uh, reinsurance companies in the globe that are already with top key drivers can go all, almost to the customer level. And I know uh, one of the uh, big and very famous companies that uh, with uh, interpretation and an analytics of one particular external driver can explain up to 70% of their revenue. So things are happening and definitely this is the subject for us to learn. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa. I'm going to go ahead and launch our first polling question. Our first polling question is asking you, the audience, to share with us if you leverage driver-based modeling at your company. So we appreciate everyone's consideration in answering all of our polling questions here today. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and leave the polling question up for another few seconds. Then we'll go ahead and take a quick peek at the results. We'll get Larissa's thoughts on the results, and then um, we will let uh, Larissa uh, set the stage uh, for Tanya and her great case study. So I'm going to go ahead and close the polling question here in a couple seconds, give you a few more seconds here, and I'm going to go ahead and close the polling question, and let's go ahead and share the results. And uh, Larissa, do you have any initial thoughts on the polling question results? I would say that uh, the result is even better than uh, expected. So 88% is quite a good figure. Um, the majority of big organizations, they still developing it. And uh, I would say that smaller companies, uh, they are uh, obviously better with this, you see. Uh, no surprise that we have partially driver-based models, uh, but the majority the, 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 the majority of the planning is still going to uh, this very static method. And there are some companies that still uh, consider to implement this. So it's a good result. And now uh, this is the time for me uh, to introduce to everyone uh, our guest from Germany, Tanja Schlesinger, who is a Vice President of Finance at DB Regia. AG, and she's responsible for central uh, region in Germany. So Tanya, uh, Tanya uh, delivered this, uh, this case study at one of the Frankfurt uh, FTNA boards, and really everyone was uh, astonished uh, how uh, quickly the transformation could be achieved when you have the right people, when you have the right approach. And I think uh, the unique features of this uh, case study that uh, it demonstrates that you can achieve a lot uh, when uh, you have this business partnering approach, when you are managing uh, very carefully your internal resources, because something what Tanya managed to achieve in quite short period of time, it was really was done, uh, it, it was done without any uh, external investment, without any external consultants, uh, and with all the resources that she had at that time in her finance department. So Tanya, you're welcome uh, to our international uh, webinar. Thank you, Larissa. Let me also give you a warm welcome to our webinar. I guess it would be easier to understand what type of business I'm in when you take a look in a nutshell at DB Regio. We're a company of public mass transportation in Germany. Our business started to face um, competitors like 12 to 15 years ago. And that business changed quite a bit. Why has it changed? Um, mass transportation um, is done either by trains or by bus. And currently, it's public contracts that we sign, that we try to win, um, and we are remunerated with contractors' fees. On the train side, it's roughly 30 public um, contracts, uh, public hands that hand out contracts. And on the bus side, that is manifold, that is over 400. Altogether, um, our group company um, today makes a turnover of roughly 8.8 .8 billion euro. Uh, the EBIT is uh, 6% more or less. Um, and currently, where our performance is measured, that is in uh, 
person kilometers, how many passengers get along on our um, either trains or buses. Why did I highlight uh, in red the region central? That is the part I'm in charge of for train transportation. And let me only give you a brief um, overview what central does today. We have a contribution of 15% of the overall turnover of our group company. And our EBIT is more or less the same as of my um, group company. Well, when you talk about handling so many contracts, and mostly it's different lines or a set of lines that are contracted out, then the question is, how do you handle that? Larissa asked me a question when we started to talk about the webinar. And as we see that on the next slide, the FPNA is definitely a challenge as the operations has so many challenges to um, see anything and forecast anything before you had it. Maybe we go for a second back to the, uh, to the FPNA challenges. I started four years ago in that company and I definitely entered a world of manually created reports and manual analysis. It took weeks for a detailed analysis and much longer, of course, for deep dives. In my staff, few business talents and demographically a mushroom cloud with one third of people being over 50 years old and 20% of my staff already leaving within the next few years. So I was wondering, how do you face that? That's definitely less personnel who knows intuitively where to derive data, how to put reports together. Um, and of course, less people who can manually still create reports and analysis. Then the other part of our challenge um, headed uh, came with the competition. We had many contracts and they, each one of them awaited, of course, a solid profit management. Now, think back of manually created reports, manual analysis, and probably when you look today at um, more or less 30 contracts, you probably know what I'm talking about, that that is quite a challenge. The next point also for challenges brings me up to um, the question of hmm, what is your data model behind? And at the end, the data model that lies on a very grown legacy IT. So the four challenges, time, it has cost consuming processes, then my people dependence on the process with a high risk of errors, little transparency in the light of uh, legacy systems, and the fourth being a, a very high level of inefficiency. For the FPNA, we started out, and that brings me to the next slide, to better understand our key value drivers. The set looks quite intense, but at the end, it's the six major points, starting from market competition, our customer with the quality, turnover, resources, of course, investment, and a few financial KPIs. And the, our step and solution to meet the challenge, as I pointed out earlier, was this first step that the KPI set was established to measure performance. And the KPIs did not only get derived from profit and loss positions, many of them reflect the quality of operational issues. They show a significant influence on the KPIs that at the end have a lasting effect on our profit. And the KPIs tackle all issues of the company from market and competitive situation, customers, contractors, passengers, and of course, turnover resources, and that is well the investment. So the first step with the KPI set was done. In the second step, we asked for the key drivers of those KPIs, and those were specified on a more detailed basis. In the third step and the last step, we wanted to get to know our key drivers, which had the most influence in profit. Larissa pointed out the 2080, Ratio. And of course, I can only agree. Why was that 
um, task of finding the key value drivers now is so crucial to us. When we look at the next slide, you find that currently my region acts together with eight public contractors. Those contractors handed out 27 contracts, and to fulfill each contract, we currently have 46 different data resources, uh, sources. That is quite a lot. And in the contracts, in the 27 contracts, currently, and that is our head, our highlights that we look at every single day, our reporting duties, which at the end, if you cannot fulfill them, call for penalty charges. And there are 234 different duties. That is quite a lot. But at the end, when you see the number of the data set at the very bottom of the slide, you probably understand why any manual process will take you far from being timely, accurate, and transparent to anyone when you do those processes when you run them manually. Nevertheless, transparency is crucial for better decisions. And I can only tell you, transparency wins. You get better decisions, higher competitiveness, less intuition, you become more analytical, and a more data-driven validation helps you in your business judgment. I already highlighted with uh, the triangle and the 54 million data sets that we had one special key driver um, where we highlighted that position first. You see that here with a green uh, markup. It says, again, when we look at 20% of our key drivers that are accountable for 80% of our income contribution, that definitely was one to me. We started to look at those profit and loss positions with which we lost the most of our profit contribution and we aimed immediately at penalty payments. From my um, earnings last year, I lost roughly 20% on penalty payments and I knew I wanted to avoid that in the future. The penalty payment themselves are not key drivers for themselves but the underlying effect, our operative quality, they describe the key drivers of the PNL position turnover. When we saw the 254 different quality parameters, a total database of 54 million needs to be looked at daily, needs to be looked at to derive predictions and prevent all the wrong decisions. Interestingly, the decision will not be taken by any management, but by the operative staff, like our crew planners, the dispatchers, or our workshop planning for maintenance and repair. This is why in the, uh, the tools in the context of business intelligence commonly used um, by business units and the FPNA, they became so crucial. Um, I come back to challenges. On the next slide, you see the data-driven transformation triangle for better insights. I just dropped the name of BI before, business intelligence. To me, BI is more than ready to use reports. To me, BI ensures one single source of truth. To me, BI enables all levels of employees from top management to operative staff to share the same information to me, BI visualizes information that otherwise gets lost in the sea of big data. And to me, as a very last point to this, BI is the basis for a prompt, location independent, user device unlimited access to the very essential information for planning, analytics, and better decisions. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya. I'm gonna go ahead and launch our second polling question, just asking you to share with us uh, the, the technology that you're currently leveraging at your company. So again, I appreciate everyone's consideration in answering all of our polling questions. I want to remind you that we can take your questions in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. You have an outstanding opportunity to tap the expertise 
of world-renowned experts in this area that we're speaking about today. So I encourage you uh, to take advantage of that opportunity. So I'm going to go ahead and leave the polling question up for a few more seconds. Then we're going to go ahead and take a quick look at the results. Then we're going to get Tanya's initial reaction. Uh, and then she's going to continue with her content uh, for a few more slides. And then we're going to get a peek at her fantastic solution that she was able to develop. So let me go ahead and close the polling question and share the results. And uh, Tanya, any uh, initial reaction here? Well, the picture reminds me of um, a lot of talks, a lot of exchange I found on the issue of the iTools. And I must admit, Excel, the Microsoft version, is not always the wrong decision. It always depends on the mass, the load of data you're using. Um, and also to use both is, of course, the right answer because mostly BI tools give you um, a sharp look, a quick look um, at what you need to work on. But at the end, usually to finalize uh, data analysis, Excel does help you still. Mm -hmm. Marisa, what do you think of the picture? Uh, no surprises here. Excel continues to be the most popular tool uh, in FP&A world and in finance world generally. And the reason for this is because it gives us a lot of flexibility. But the reality is that, yes, it's very risky and uh, definitely it's not going to give us uh, the same level of uh, analytics that we can get from the solution. So, Tanya, uh, my understanding that now you're uh, almost ready to demonstrate the solution that you uh, developed ex internally in your company and even demonstrate some of the amazing capabilities of this solution. So you're right. welcome. But before then, <laughs> I gave you a quick look of what our data landscape um, looked like um, one and a half years ago. There's little to add to this picture, but when you look at it on the very left side, on the input side, we have those 46 different data um, um, systems where you find original operative data. In the middle, the competing islands of information. They are missing, of course, an integration to make information accessible to everybody. And we had a long war of which report told you more truly the truth than the other. And it was a waste of time. Usually, before any BI gets implemented, this situation can be seen in most companies. There is no easy access to the operative systems, and the data gathering is very time consuming and also likely for retrieval errors. And of course, whatever you put peanuts in, you get a peanuts only out. Whatever the working on data in the middle makes it so handicapped your output is probably suffering from that. So that way, we changed the situation. And um, we were, of course, aiming for a single point of truth that you see on the next slide. That single point of truth can, of course, only be achieved with one or the other software with business intelligence. And at the end, it should aim at solving this problem. Of course, there are many consultants out with their own applications, or you train a technical talent in-house, what makes the business tick. Um, the one way, if you work with consultants, you're very dependent on their software, on their consultancy hours, and probably you find yourself at the end of your process with extra thick cost. We chose the other way. Um, we, of course, had an in-house capacity, and that only works when the techies that you have at hand um, get to know how the business ticks. And it's easier when it's people from the inside because they already might know the company a bit better than anyone who comes as a consultant just flying in for a limited period of time. Then you need data scientists. You, you hook them up with your business talents, and the business talent usually needs to be eager to be trained in what technology and tech, the techies can help them to achieve. Um, 
So what we did, we worked on a BI software that has a self-service um, analysis function. We tried to come from a very generic view and then let people drill down to the level they want to know. And since the data behind, not only to the penalty charges, but to, to our whole company uh, data sets is so large, it's an ocean. Um, we came up with a solution of little cost. We had an internal um, techie guy who was eager to um, access all the data, bring it together, have the hygienic uh, part first, and then put on the algorithms together with our business units. And before I talk too much about it, I'll let you see that. Uh -huh. okay. So we're now on our... Uh, yes, Tanya, I can uh, see your screen now. You can see the screen, wonderful. Enlarge it. So, I talked about a lot of contracts, and we started out with an overview of the contracts for our contract managers, which are more or less product managers. Those people have, for each contract that can be clicked from the one to the other, and be chosen and you change immediately. So that's pretty fast with knowing that there's tons of data behind. We talked about what they need as information at first sight. And we knew it's earnings, it's our EBIT, it's punctuality. I'm sorry, I didn't translate it. It's all still in German, but nevertheless, should give you a good insight on what um, we're doing. Work with donut um, science, then asked to show where our biggest problem lies with our penalty payments. And you can see the ratio, um, how many of the penalties we pay, for example, for punctuality that is uh, driven by uh, construction on our trail racks, then uh, punctuality that is probably comes from um, not enough personnel or sick personnel, and there's different clusters, so the cluster diagram helps out to tackle the first and biggest issues. Um, one special other penalty is shown on the donut diagram on the very uh, right-hand side. So that is probably from the operative view of a product manager the most important information. And at the end, he sees also his earnings um, on a monthly line if he wants to go down to details of his penalties, he can do so here. Shows now the year to, um, 2018. You can change to the year before if you want. And it does that. The calculus is immediately shown. So that is on our product side. When we go at a closer look at the penalties, because those were really uh, giving us a lot of pain, we had the penalties usually shown for each contract only. Here you can go into all together or choose one of the contracts specifically. When you want to drill down and see what did January do, okay. Close the one window view, as you can see. You get, for example, the years, you take the 18, you get all the, the details monthly. With the punctuality, as more detail. It shows you where was our aim, what did we aim at, and where are we currently in the year 2018. Now, there was a very specific problem that we had with our train conductors. Our contracts today say that our train conductors need to be allocated with different ratios along the contract, what it tells you to fulfill. And we have specific contracts that come out with a 25 ratio that needs to be fulfilled during the day between 7 o'clock and 1900. 
and then 100% of each train needs to be conduct, uh, accompanied by a train conductor. Um, so we have those two measures, because if you do not fulfill those, then you're penalized. And as we see here in a total, that is one contract. Of course, you can say, wow, wonderful. I did get a good uh, hit on the 25% ratio, but at the end, how did we perform to find this? The performance is pretty bad because there are too many people on the trains allocated between seven and 1900 hours. So when you take a look at this um, and you go further to other contracts, where for example here, the 25% has only been fulfilled by 19, um, up to a level of 19%, and you pay probably the most charges on that, those. That is always only our look back. The look back gives you historically a good feel what worked, what did not work. And the question is, how do you come from recognizing what your key drivers tell you in the past to how do you prevent that how do you get in a better prediction process? And for that, we created, we talk about applications because it's within the system, different applications. We have now one application that is used both by the FPNA and also by the operative personnel in, um, uh, in our business unit, by the crew rostering, by the planners. So what do they do? Um, Sure. When they work, they, the difficulty for our crew rostering, and they are the key drivers of the quality of fulfillment for our um, um, crew ratio that we have to bring on trains. See here, um, for example, a contract that has a 25% fulfillment level. When we talk about that, in that contract throughout the months to April, or if we only want to have the first couple of months, February, you get immediately a response from the system with all the data behind. It's accurate, it's there at your fingertips, you don't have to ask anyone to run reports. Everybody can use it on mobile devices, on laptops, on your internet connection. Uh, so it's ready to use from any point wherever you are. The, the comfort, a comfortable position that we have with this is, at the end, our trains need to be accompanied equally, all the trains, not only the couple first 10 or so, with 25% of personnel. And you can see at the very end, there is all the trains are behind, the less we fulfill the ratio. So in our contracts, when our contractor hands out um, the paper, they expect that there is an equal distribution of that ratio. And unfortunately, when you see that in the past, you were not able to meet that, penalty charge is immediately on um, your desk. So this, what we see now in an analysis for the historic data, the same is used by our operative personnel in the business unit, by the crew rostering personnel, and they can simulate with their expected planning what the ratio will be. If they hit the average on every train, they can uh, simulate if they're crew rostering when they adapted um, to a better level, if that second try brought them closer to avoid penalty payments. And this happened to make us so happy that, let me go back to the penalties, um, that we were able to reduce those in year 2018, um, a lot over the months. So that is hidden. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Tanya, I'm wondering how long did it take you to implement this solution internally uh, with your limited a very resources? Good question. We had it off um, with one application with the penalty payments on punctuality um, and expected with one person on the programming side and more or less a day every week one of our business units accompanies that programmer took us three months only and we had all the penalty payments on punctuality ready to use available as information to everybody and to me a, a system development of your IT system that can be ready to use in three months is just an incredibly short period of time. And I was wondering if anyone had a, a very similar experience, but the, um, our luxury was that we were not depending on external consultants. We had a the I system, a, so, a software that we use that was covering, so we kicked out a couple of other software that we had, and with uh, the kick out of uh, the other software, we were able to um, more than um, fill up um, our needs for, from what we needed to fund our new system, the new BI system. So it's um, one person, three months, and it's ready to be used. Sounds fantastic. It's a great huh? example. It's a great example how you can uh, utilize your internal resources. Uh, last in the last two weeks, we opened uh, three additional FPNA boards in America uh, on the western coast and also in Chicago. And the main concerns that people had regarding analytical uh, transformation and FPNA, the first one is funding. It's always difficult uh, to find uh, uh, the, the, the proper funding for, the, for such a comprehensive project. Uh, and the second one, people. So um, people are already so busy at, uh, in FPNA. So how to find this additional time for this additional project? And this is my second question, Tanya. So obviously you did this uh, inside of your team. Uh, you, your people worked obviously very, very hard. But how did you manage to combine this with other deadlines and with other activities that you already have in your department? That's a very good question. That was an additional deadline set by me. There are, well, it's sometimes hard to talk about weekend work. <laughs> um, we could avoid that, but we had probably added uh, for two people in my FPNA department two hours over a period of three weeks two hours every day, and that was manageable. I think when you get started, the one thing that you tackle, the funding is created by kicking out legacies, parts of legacies that you have. The funding is, so to say, um, an easy run. On the people side, um, you definitely have to bring the one, the techie person together to, to understand how the business ticks and to train our business talents or FPNA personnel in what technology and the techies can help them to achieve. There is literally no understanding of the two worlds and it's bringing them together. So the easiest and for us, it was very important to find an issue that probably can be run in a few weeks with the large leverage. And as soon as you find those um, PNL positions or operative questions that you need to find a solution for, the faster you will be uh, inspired to take one topic, the next one, and people will come up with new ideas. Um, and after half a year, we had a very long list of topics that people wanted to have programmed because they were inspired and saw in real t- real time and real life what the facilitator with BPI could help them to achieve. So the transparency was there, the speed was there, um, the funding was no question. Um, and to take on the side, out of the, your line function, people, two or three 
is probably not a big investment at all. And as long as you find the first very good showcase, people will come automatically and they, the inspiration helps with that. Oh, this is very interesting uh, and very inspiring case study, Tanya. Thank you so much for presenting. And I believe that uh, now there should be some um, questions from the audience. But before doing this, I believe that uh, we, we have the last polling question. Is it true, Ernie? Yes, Larissa, I've gone ahead and launched our final polling question. So once again, we appreciate everyone's consideration answering our final polling question, just trying to get some information on the analytical uh, solution that you currently leverage uh, at your company. We're gonna go ahead and leave the polling question up for probably about 10 more seconds. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and take a quick look uh, at the results, uh, see what Tanya and Larissa think about those results. Then we'll transition into our Q&A session. Uh, you can still ask questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. And then we'll wrap things up with some recommendations and conclusions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the polling question here and I'm going to go ahead and um, share those results and going to go ahead and kind of read those off uh, for Tanya because uh, we still have her screen live. So uh, Tanya, what we're seeing is 49% um, A, mainly uh, self-service managed by finance. We have 10% we rely on external help and then we've got 39% both self-service and external help. For me that 49% mainly self-service is pleasantly surprising. Do you have any initial thoughts? Anyway, um, either with external help or without, both is crucial to get started. And probably along the way, as you intensively work with uh, external help, with consultants, you realize that depending on them makes no fun. And the broader you get in uh, actually describing your um, um, key drivers system-wise, the, the wider you, you spread out your view, the more likely you, you get to see that you should have that in source. That's my personal view. Okay, I would like great. to add here, in regards to a mainly a self-service um, driven by finance solutions, I just hope that uh, people, when they uh, voted for this, uh, hopefully they didn't mean uh, the Excel system, you see. But uh, if uh, this is exactly uh, the dedicated FPNA uh, solution and 50% of people already managing this inside of their department, then this is a very good result, I would say. Obviously, the biggest trend at the moment to look at the solutions that you can manage uh, inside of your department, not to be de dependent on external consultants or on your IT department. We don't have time for this anymore. So it's a good timing for Q&A session. So please, uh, would you like um, yes. to reveal your questions thank you very, now? Thank you very much. Uh, Larissa and Tanya, thank you very much for your fantastic case study and your fantastic insights. So first question I will direct to Larissa. I'm just asking you to, to kind of uh, circle back and give us a little bit uh, more color. I know FB&A professionals struggle with this quite a bit. Can you give us a little bit more color in terms of what you've heard in your experience? How do we find those key drivers, those 20% that explain 80% of the results? What, what's some of the art behind that? This is a great question, and actually, this is the biggest uh, challenge at the moment. So many uh, uh, large organizations that yeah, I know, they started this journey uh, to discover uh, these uh, key drivers, these 20% of drivers that can uh, describe 80% of the results. So there are different ways how it's possible to do it, uh, and obviously, the method is sensitivity analysis. So which drivers are the most sensitive, uh, which drivers are really uh, help us uh, to change the situations and to play uh, scenarios very easily. Uh, and obviously, uh, the more advanced method that uh, some companies already started, this is to use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence 
uh, to analyze all those data, uh, uh, data oceans that you have and to do the sensitivity for you. And the trick is uh, that drivers, they have a live concept. So they are dying and they are uh, born. There are some new drivers and there are some drivers that probably not so important anymore. So the process should be uh, always automated. It always should be analyzed. So this is the trick of this modern method. I hope I answered. Probably Adam, yeah. you from uh, the practitioner. Um, the question is, which are key drivers? And then the second question comes up immediately, which are so uh, influenceable. Where are you in the driver's seat? And that process we had done in an agile way. We act, acted with, together with our business units and so to say worked through the process to um, highlight our largest impact areas. And then asked what each party, the business unit uh, responsible person and the FPNA personnel could contribute to make that impact that key driver better. And what if and in the next step, uh, step only we ask what would be the tool that needs to be set up? The, the tool question came at the very, very end. But uh, key driver identification is not finalized until you uh, can explain if you are in the driver's seat of that key driver. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and uh, direct my next question um, to Tanya first. So uh, obviously you seem to be successfully transforming your business. And one of the key areas of FP&A success that we talk about quite a bit, we've actually done a webinar on it, is FP&A business partnering. So Tanya, could you give us a little bit more color on how you were able to evolve your staff to deliver this fundamental change, which must have required a lot of buy-in across the enterprise? To do, we had a long discussion on which business talent of my FP&A staff is eager enough to accept change, because the whole thing about transformation is accepting and assisting change in the company. Um, and surprisingly enough, one of our older staff uh, was ident identified because there was a lot of curiosity in that person. And we loved to see that person play with traditional processes, new perspectives, and um, that person also had a very high standing within my staff. So everybody looked up at what will happen there. Um, so it needs a showcase and uh, transformation can be more likely to be done with people who are curious, who are willing to change the way they work, or who, who are unhappy with uh, the process, with the manual doing. Uh, I would like to add here that um, uh, obviously FPNA business partner has a dual role. The first one, uh, this is the partnering with business, understanding their needs. But the second one, uh, this is to uh, challenge the traditional status quo with these additional analytical challenges. And uh, exactly, this is a great question because uh, driver-based analysis, when uh, driver-based planning, when it's cascaded to operation, operational level, this is a great tool for FPNA business partnering. This is the great tool to uh, educate uh, business partners, but also to learn from business partners. And also, this is the great tool uh, to change and transform uh, the culture of the company from traditional budgeting to analytical. So do we have more questions, Ernie, or is it yeah. timing for yeah. us to make some conclusions? Yeah, let me, uh, let me uh, a uh, ask one more question, uh, Larissa, because this is, this is a common question that I get uh, often on webinars and the follow-up and in my conversations with uh, finance professionals across the enterprise. So once we have a webinar, there's, there's always a question on, you know, where do I start? How do I put a fine point on your great content and insights? So Larissa and Tanya, please feel free to add context as well. 
what are the key steps in ensuring that driver-based FP&A work? Can you give us maybe three to five things? And then, Tanya, if you might want to add some color, that'd be great. And then we can uh, go to our conclusions and recommendations. Tanya, so you start first, and I will add. Okay, that was on um, what makes you win, right? Absolutely, yeah. exactly. To me, the competitive position of your company makes the whole game. And at the end, you, you find yourself in facing a risk of not moving fast enough, of being left behind, and uh, find yourself behind those who invested sooner or more heavily in digital innovation. The strong innovators aggressively pursue the innovation's avenues. And we find that in our contracts, they are handed out by the public where we find ourselves in a strong competition game. And we know that as long as we cannot meet competitive levels by a strong digitalization of internal processes and by funding those enablers, we probably are left behind in the game. I would like to add here that um, the, the, the biggest factor in analytical transformation and in developing of uh, driver-based uh, approach in the company uh, is really starts from, the, from business culture. So the main question to ask uh, in your planning and analysis, uh, what is the percentage of your planning and analysis is judgment? What is the planning, what, what is the percentage is analytics? If your judgment is much higher, if you have uh, during your uh, budgeting uh, cycles, you have a lot of um, political games, a lot of negotiations of targets for the bonuses purposes. So maybe the culture is not analytical at all. And uh, it all starts from the top. Uh, obviously, there should be support from the management. But uh, also from other side, I see a lot of examples when analytical challenge starts from the bottom when it starts from those analytical uh, people and also from, in particular, FP&A department, when they uh, start to show uh, what is going to happen in the future and what are the key factors to succeed. So uh, I would say that culture is the first factor. The second is quality of data. The third one uh, is our current case really demonstrated. This is the ability of people uh, to analyze um, data and to derive this uh, huge, uh, the, the, the key drivers, and then development of a driver-based model, implementation this through the system. I would say that this is the key steps that we need to follow in an analytical transformation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a good timing now for recommendations. So um, uh, the subject of today's webinar, it was about driver-based analytics and driver-based planning. So uh, the first recommendation, obviously, data collection should be automated and data quality, um, it should be addressed as well. Get more people involved in contributing less data more frequently. Uh, use drivers as the language of performance. Uh, don't be static. Don't uh, plan on, uh, on the level of your almost to the general ledger level. Uh, get sponsorship for change from the top, but as I already mentioned, that uh, also um, challenge the status quo, analytical status quo in your company, and implement this in phases. So today we saw a wonderful example how internally, uh, with the education, wish, and uh, collaboration of people, uh, you can transform this quite easily. And then conclusions are uh, data-based planning and analysis. This is an essential business tool with multiple benefits to the organization. And the reality is this is the basis for modern FP&A. Uh, it's used by most businesses in one form or another, but this is the time for us in this incredible uh, world of unknown unknowns to use this, uh, to use the fully driver-based model. Driver-based planning should be integrated, and the ways how uh, to integrate this through, through cascade of drivers and also implement this through one solution. Um, agreed and well-defined drivers, this is very important method how we can manage performance. And as we already mentioned, uh, don't go into hundreds of drivers. There are 10 or 15 or maybe 20 key drivers that can explain uh, the majority of outcomes of your business. And obviously, remember about time concept of your business. So if you created your model 
10 years ago, and if you think that you know your drivers, probably this is not true anymore because there are so many external internal drivers and uh, they're appearing and they're disappearing. So use model, modern technologies to help you to analyze the sensitivity of all those available drivers. Uh, that's it uh, from the conclusions point of view. Uh, I would like also to update you on our plans in the next three months. So 23rd of May, we will have a very interesting case study from Stat Oil Company, one of the biggest oil companies in the world, the company from Norway. And we are lucky to have Bjarte Bognes, who is uh, the thought leader in the area of beyond budgeting in the world, the author of many books and a chairman of Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. So he will be our speaker and he will share with us how this huge and well-known and public company managed to abandon the budget. Uh, then uh, on the 28th of June, we will look at another interesting transformational case. And it, it will be from Switzerland. Uh, it will be from Stefan Spiegel. Uh, and it will be again about how beyond budgeting, how the process of abandoning traditional process uh, can transform the company. And then uh, on the 3rd of July, um, we will have interesting transformational ca case from European CFO of Nielsen, Frederick Hedlund. So this is how we uh, transition of organizational structure. Uh, Frederick uh, and his team managed uh, to completely transform the way how company work, how they uh, manage to have a lot of savings and then to reinvest this into analytics. So this is uh, for the webinars. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Ernie, for managing this webinar. You are our webinar guru, and uh, thank you so much for making this so smooth and, and manageable for us. Tanya, thank you so much for your uh, interesting case study. And we are looking forward uh, to more webinars. We are looking forward to receive more questions from you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Larissa. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Tanya and Larissa for their great content. Uh, I also want to remind the audience, uh, once we close the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to, to uh, request to be connected with Larissa or Tanya with a couple mouse clicks. And I want to thank you so much for your valuable time today. We hope to see you in person in an upcoming international FP&A roundtable and or on our next global FP&A webinar. Make the rest of your day great, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, you too.